Okay, let's talk about stable diffusion, or uh, in particular, like latent diffusion, which is basically the same thing. Stable diffusion is latent diffusion. So let's talk about the paper that, that introduced stable diffusion. It's uh, it's not too bad, but there's some some subtle parts that isn't in the main paper that uh, is kind of cool to look at, especially the, the encoder decoder. But anyways, getting ahead of ourselves, uh, I guess. Uh, let me, oh, yeah, let me hide this. All right, cool. All right, let's get into it. So uh, latent diffusion is kind of popular because it's an open sourced um, version of diffusion. It was kind of the first one, and I think the the only one still. That's that's pretty much open source. So ki kind of cool, but it also uh, made diffusion what it is today. Um, anyways, first off, what is a diffusion model? Um, I kind of went into this in last video, but uh, real quick, say we have this face. I think. Uh, call him Joe, then we um, we take this image, which we'll, we'll call x, at uh, x sub 0, and then we add a little bit of noise to it. And by noise, I, uh, our noise will be z, which is sampled from a normal distribution with the mean and variance of um, with a, a mean of zero and a variance of one, or it can be any distribution actually as long, but usually a normal distribution. Then there will be a little bit of noise and it'll be the same exact image. It'll still be Joe, but just with a little bit of noise and this will be X sub one. Then you do this again and you do this uh, big sub T times where big sub T is usually like a thousand or big sub t may be equal to 5,000, 2,000, whatever. So usually 1,000 or higher. Uh, the original diffusion paper did 1,000, and that seems to be a pretty good, pretty good basis. And once it's at this time step, it'll be all noise. And you can think of this as uh, an interpolation where x sub t is equal to x, it'll be equal to, um, we'll just say it'll be t minus little t times x sub zero plus um, one, I guess that would have to be divided by, so it'd be t minus little t, little t over big t, so this will be between zero and one, times x sub zero plus one minus uh, this part right here, t minus little t over big T times the the noise z, where z is from the, the z is from the normal distribution. And at time zero, x sub zero, or yeah, at time oh no, I need to switch these around. Sorry, this will be this will be z, and this will be x sub zero. At time zero. This will be one, meaning that it's all the original image. But at time, uh, and when I say time, I mean we're changing little t. So little t is the one that's changing. Big T is our set 1,000 uh, big T. Uh, and then at time 500, it'll be half of uh, the noise and half of the image. And at time 1,000, or big T, it'll be all uh, Oh no, I had it right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, you can th you can think of it as an interpolation between the the image and the uh, the noise. Where as you increase the no the number of time steps, there is more noise in the image, and there's less orig image in the image itself. And the way you do this is with the function. I think they called it p in the original paper, and then you use a function called q with parameter. Th parameters theta, which is just a neural network, q sub theta, to denoise the image. So you, you, you have a, you have this function, which is just this interpolation that adds noise to the image, 
and you train a network, neural network Q, Q sub theta, which denoises the, which removes noise from the, the noisy image. At this step, it would remove a little bit of noise. So at, at this step right here, Q takes in this image, and then it removes a little bit of noise, and then you get this, or you get the original image. That's kind of how diffusion models work. You add noise, and then you train a model to unnoise one step at a time. And to uh, once you train an image on all time steps on a bunch of images, then if I were to sample z from a normal distribution, uh, zero one, and I make an image and I make an image of this noise, and then I feed it through q, q sub theta, q sub theta, then I'll get an image with a little bit less noise. And if I do this a thousand times, then I'll get some image, which uh, it could be Joe, could be Joe, our original, our, our original man Joe, or, but it will likely be something else because we trained it on a bunch of images and it knows a lot, which is what you see today. Um, and that's the, that's the basics of, of diffusion. Uh, the way you train this is if I, actually, yeah, the, the way you train this is if I have an image at time t, this is x sub t, then I throw it through a unit, which this is like a convolution. So I throw it through a unit, which will give us some latent down here, some something in the latent space and so on. Your normal old unit. Um, and then this outputs, you would think it would output x sub t minus one because we're removing noise, but the original paper found that if I, so if I had this image here, with uh, Joe in it, then what we predict is actually the noise in x sub t, the noise that we want to remove. Uh, the noise that we want to remove to get from step t to t minus 1 specifically, not all the noise. And the way, and then what we can do is we can subtract the noise from here. And the way you train the model is using uh, the using the loss function. So uh, say we have some noise, z is sampled from a normal distribution. Then, uh, let me find the, uh, let me find the, here it is. All right, uh, in this case they use epsilon for the, uh, the parameterization, but the loss is equal to the uh, oh, uh, the epsilon sub theta means that this is the, our epsilon sub theta is this unit right here. This is our epsilon sub theta, and um, and it's called epsilon sub theta and not q sub theta because you're predicting the noise rather than going directly from x sub t to x sub t minus one. So our epsilon sub theta is this is what it's predicting right here, which is the noise at time t epsilon sub t, and the loss is equal to the mean squared error between, uh, I guess I won't use the, it'll be epsilon, and the model at of uh, this epsilon given t. So this is our, this first part is the actual noise itself that we sampled from the, di the distribution. And the second part is the, the the predicted noise, and you just have the model predict the noise inside x sub t. Uh, actually, I'm going to write this out in a better way so that you can see kind of how um, it's working. Um, because you may be thinking a unit is not, it's deterministic, so how can it predict noise? Well, let me show you it this way. If we, it's actually given x sub t, and instead we give it x x sub t, we give it um, the parameterization of, um, uh, like this was our parameterization right here for x sub t. If we put that in there, we put that right there, where this first part is how much of the real image we have, and then the second part is how much of the noise we have, where I guess it's epsilon instead of um, t then you can see that all the model has to do is remove the real part of the image and then it predicts the 
the noise from the image. So that's how um, that's how you can get a model to kind of predict the the noise from an image, and then you compare that to the original the original noise using MSC, and that's your loss. Uh, yeah, and that's that's kind of how um, a normal diffusion model works. So now let's get into the the problems with diffusion. Uh, the first problem with diffusion is that it, there's a long, long generation time. In a normal GAN, what you do is you sample some noise, you throw it through an encoder, or you throw it through uh, the generator, and then it'll output an image, whatever that looks like. So it'll be our picture of Joe. That'll be, that's our generator. So you sample some noise, you throw it through a generator, and it produces your image and it's one step. But in our case, for a diffusion model, you have to throw it through, we'll call it D. You have to throw it through uh, the diffusion model multi uh, a thousand times, or however many time steps you have to get your output image. And that's a lot worse than just taking noise and putting it through the, um, the generator and getting it in one step. Uh, another problem with diffusion is that you need a lot more training data. Uh, training data. You need a lot more training data to train a diffusion model rather than GAN. And I just wanted to bring these up. Um, the, light, the light in diffusion model kind of solves the uh, long generation time. It, it helps it out a bit, but uh, the training data part this doesn't really help with that. Just wanted to bring it up though. Uh, anyways, let's get into how this paper, uh, how this paper does what it does. The idea of this paper is why are we generating images in pixel space, which is this space. It's just the, the space that humans can visualize. When our unit is taking this and converting it to a latent space and then blowing the image back up to the original image or whatnot. The, the idea is, or it wouldn't be blowing it up to the original image, but it would be giving you the noise. And the idea is kind of why, why not use this latent property to help us out if we're already using latent, why don't we always use latent? So why don't we create something that allows us to directly do diffusion on latent instead of using uh, a model that does diffusion on a pixel space? Because the latent space is a lot smaller than the uh, the latent space is a lot smaller than the um, the pixel space. So why don't we? generate images using the latent space as opposed to generating images using the pixel space. This way, uh, it'll be a lot more computationally friendly because we're dealing with smaller images, but, uh, and uh, dealing with latent, yeah, dealing with latent, will, in, will, it will speed up the generation time because you're dealing with smaller images and you have to do a lot less, um, you, have, you, you have to do a lot less computations on your GPU, which is, which is very nice, so. Why don't we just do something in the latent space as opposed to doing something in the in the pixel space? And that's the idea of this paper. So how do we get something in the in the latent space in the first place? That's um that's difficult to do. Uh, you may be thinking an autoencoder because that's how one usually puts something in the in a latent space, and that's exactly what they do. They take an image. Uh, they, they actually have two training steps. The first training, the first part of training is you take an image, or you take, uh, yeah, you take an image, and then you throw it through your encoder, which they call, uh, oh, they throw it through the encoder. If we scroll down, where's it at? Oh, right here. They throw it through, this will be our X, and they throw it through an encoder. Then you get out your latents, 
and then you can decode that and you get out your original image and that's just how an autoencoder works but first uh, and this this is x today uh, the the diagram over here is kind of scary but breaking it down and the idea is to train this encoder decoder model so that we can do diffusion in this latent space right here as opposed to doing the diffusion on x and x tode and we'll get into kind of how you can inf do inference with that so how do they how do they train this and that's one of my favorite parts of this paper which is how they actually train this encoder decoder model Uh, scroll down to page 29 they use this scary loss function here but uh, it's not it's not too bad but it's it's like it's it's pretty cool how they do it they follow 23 which I think is VQGAN I think that's what that is uh, anyways the way you train this is you take an image you take an image X and you throw it through an encoder, just like we showed above. And the encoder is, yeah, it's, it's that way. Uh, and then you get your latents. And then you take your decoder and you decode the image back to the original image. And this is just a normal autoencoder. However, they do something cool where they use a discriminator which is D, is that, is that phi? Uh, D pitchfork looking thing, <laughs> I think that's phi. Um, and the discriminator, like a, in, a, in a GAN, so if you, if you think of a GAN, you have, uh, an inco you have a, a generator. And you can think of this as our generator right here. This is our generator. And this is our fake image. This is our fake image. And then this is our real image right here, the, the input. This is our real image. And if you know how a GAN works, then you have a generator generating fake images. Then you have a discriminator that has to discriminate, uh, that has to say, is this image real or is this image fake? Was it produced? Was it a real image from the data set, which is the input into the autoencoder? Or was it produced by the autoencoder? Uh, in this case, or was it produced by the generator? And you take the, you take the, that was a disgusting line. <laughs> right, there we go. You take the fake image, this which is xtode, and you want the discriminator to say, all right, this is this is fake. This is uh, I'm I'm gonna predict a zero because it's fake, and you want it to predict a one, so it's just a binary classifier, saying, okay, this image is real. And uh, they, uh, the reason you use this is to kind of um, help the model generate better, better outputs as opposed, um, meaning that the latents have to be more, it has to be more content rich. If the latents have more, are, are more content rich, meaning that it, it captures more of the image, then this output will be better. And the normal loss doesn't do that. Now let's just step through each of the losses. So the first loss is L reconstruction, which is our basic loss. This is just our autoencoder loss. The MSE between X and D of, uh, or the decoder of the encoder of X. And all this is saying is that the output of the autoencoder should be the same as the input to the autoencoder. The image input should be the same as the output image. That's all this is doing. And the reason, and this is just, this is easy if you just have this loss, but it doesn't produce good enough latents to do latent diffusion on it. And that's why we have the, the discriminator there. Before we get to that, they also have this regularization. And if you know, um, if you've heard of, um, uh, VAEs, variational autoencoders, then it's, and it's very similar to that. What you do is you take this, um, uh, right here, you take the, uh, output of the encoder, uh, sorry, it'll be, uh, encoder of X, 
which will be equal to your latent. Uh, sorry, that's an, that's an L, uh, which will be equal to the latent. And you take the a normal distribution, uh, 0, 1. And you want to minimize the difference between these two, meaning that you want your latents to be as close to a normal distribution as possible. And this is just a form of normalization in the latent space. Uh, it just helps it helps the model out when um, to create uh, uh, disentangled latents uh, so that it's the latents have more rich content. And these two it's by itself are this is the first part is a normal autoencoder, and having these two is more like a variational autoencoder, where the latents have to be more of a normal distribution. It's not exactly a VAE, but it's, it's similar to a VAE. But um, the very imp the very interesting part is adding the the decoder, and that's these two that's these two uh, middle losses right here, changed to blue. Um, these two middle losses are the gener the 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 GAN losses. Your GAN loss is um, it's a it's the mini max game where it's min g max d. Uh, in this case, it'll be d uh, whatever I think it's v. And uh, g is equal to your encoder your encoder decoder your encoder decoder and then you have your discriminator. Uh, I'm going to remove G because you're actually minimizing the encoder decoder or you're minimizing the parameters of the encoder and decoder with respect to the loss uh, just like normal gradient descent. And there's two parts to this. You have the the first part is the negative log of D of E uh, sorry, it's the negative log of d v of d of e of x. Sorry, this is a massive. This is so many, so many parentheses. All right, this first part is saying, if I generate an image with the, if I generate the latents with the encoder, and I decode it with the encoder, then this should be something like close to x. And then my discriminator will take in this part, and it, and then we just do the negative log of this, which is more of a normalization term. So we can remove the negative log, and what this is saying, if we have this minimax game, then we want the parameters of the encoder and decoder to minimize this. Uh, sorry, to maximize this because it's the negative. Um, so we want our our encoder and decoder. It's it's a, it's a little backwards since you have the negative sign. The encoder and decoder are maximizing this function, and the um, discriminator is minimizing this function because there's a negative a negative in front. So you have this, um, and what what this is saying is, if I am the encoder and decoder. Then I want to produce. I want to produce an output x, so that the decoder thinks that this is as real as possible. Remember, we said something is real if it is if the uh, decoder or if the discriminator prints is a one, and the discriminator is saying, okay, I given the encoder and decoder output, I want to make this as fake as possible. Because it's like, hey, this data is fake. I need to minimize this because I need to say that I need to predict zero if the data is fake. And then the the dec the encoder and decoder are like, well, I want to make this look as real as possible to fool you. Um, and it produces this X, um, and that's L A V D. Uh, and then you have this part here plus log of um, D of phi of X plus log d phi of x. And this is kind of on its own. The encoder and decoder are not part of this, meaning that they don't have any effect on this. And you want to maximize this. This is our max. This is what um, uh, your, uh, the, the, the decoder, wa the discriminator wants to maximize this. And since it's maximizing this, that's saying, OK, given this real data, given this data that I, uh, is no, that I know is real, 
I want to make it look as real as possible, meaning I want to predict one for this. And I want to predict, well, in, in the, uh, let's just look at this in terms of both sides. If I am the encoder and decoder, I want to make the data to look as real as possible, meaning that I want to, if the decoder, ta if the discriminator takes in my input, I want it to say that this is a one, meaning that it's real. On the other hand, if I, which uh, I'll show in blue, so it wants to say that this is as real as possible. And you could argue that it also wants to make this look as fake as possible, but the encoder decoder have no idea. Like it, it, it doesn't have any impact on this, so we're not going to say that. And this will be blue, our encoder decoder. And then our discriminator is saying, OK, I want to make this data that is fake look as fake as possible, but I want to make this data that is real look as real as possible. And all that to say, if we do that, then the output of the encoder and decoder will look more real if it, it has two parts. It's saying, I want these two to be the same, but I also want this data to look real. And all that gives us some really nice latents if the, inc if the discriminator part made uh, any sense. Um, I hope it did, because uh, it was uh, I was trying to do my best to, uh, to explain that encoder decoder part. But uh, if you didn't completely get that, that's no problem at all. That's just, it's just a side note that I wanted to go into because I thought it was really cool to see how the, the encoder decoder was trained. Uh, anyways, now that, we have, now that we have an encoder decoder, which are trained, uh, yeah, let, me, let me go back up to the original image. Uh, now that we have an encoder decoder that we're trained on, say, ImageNet or something like that, some some data, some big data set. Now we can take any image, x, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's our encoder. Then we can take em any image x. We can throw it through the encoder and get out some latents. And these latents correspond to x, so we can call it L sub x or whatever. Um, actually, in their case, they call it z. So this will be z. This will be z at time zero. Then what we can do is, let me move this down. Uh, what we can do is we can take this C and we can treat it exactly like we did up here. If I add a little bit of noise, and I can't, I'm not gonna draw this out because the latents are, have no meaning to us. They are just, they look like noise to us if we look at them. So I'm not gonna draw out what C looks like because it's completely arbitrary. Anyways, you take z, you throw it through the function p, and you get z sub 1. And then you do this again multiple times until you get z sub t. And this will be all p, our noising function. And then you take your q. Uh, do they call it q? Oh, right, epsilon theta. You take epsilon theta, and you train it to unnoise this image, or unnoise the latents. And uh, remember, this is our pure noise, z sub t, and our z sub zero is our pure uh, image, meaning that if we take some noise, if we take some noise, and then we unnoise the noise in the latent space using uh, epsilon sub theta, and then we do this multiple times until we get out our uh, z sub 0 using epsilon theta then we can throw this through a decoder through the decoder we trained and get out an image which may be Joe it could be Joe if the latents are right so instead of doing it directly to Joe we're just doing it to Joe's latents as opposed to doing it on so instead of doing it in the pixel space we do diffusion in the latent space and you train this exactly the exact same way as you would train a normal diffusion model. Uh, the loss is, yeah, right here, as, as, as I noted. You train this exactly the same way. You have your noise, which is just the noise that you add to the latents. And you have your predicted noise, which is just the noise that it predicts from your latents at z sub 1 uh, to get to z sub 0. And then you just 
minimize that loss. Just like with the original diffusion model, you do the you you predict the noise. It's very very simple. Um, you just there's um, there's just you're just doing it in the latent space. To summarize real quick, uh, you you have two training steps. Uh, two training steps. Your first one is train an autoencoder, which is just an autoencoder with just a normal, the autoencoder we showed earlier. To take in X, it takes in that, it outputs a Z, and then it takes this Z, and Zs are latent, then it outputs the original X, X tilde. And then our second part is once you have a, f a completely trained encoder decoder, then you train a diffusion model, uh, which d to take z at time z at time t and produce z through, through the diffusion model, and you get z at time t minus one. And whenever you're training the diffusion model, the encoder and decoder are frozen because those are already trained. The, there's no reason to do that. Plus, you're also only going to be using the encoder when training the, the diffusion model because the decoder is only for taking the noise and uh, or taking the lanes and then producing the origin the image. Okay, now how do you condition this? Because we already know that you can take an image and you can throw it through a diffusion model and it produces you or you can take some noise, you can throw it through a diffusion model, and then it produces you an amazing image. But how can I tell it what to generate? Well, the way they do that is through this right part here. And they actually say, why only do text when we can do literally everything? <laughs> um, why not condition it on image? Why not condition it on, on images, which I guess would be in painting in that case, or whatever other modalities you've seen. They, they're like, we can do condition on anything, as long as we train this row here. I think that's row. Uh, the way they do that is uh, through cross attention. So if we have a, if you, I made a video on attention, and I'm just going to briefly go through attention like really, really quick here. And if we have this, if we have our latent Z, our latent C will be an image. What we do is we flatten the image to a, pix a bunch of pixels, or I guess in this case you would patchify the image, and then it would be flattened patches, like in a VIT. Uh, actually, I'm gonna pr I'm gonna make it uh, upright like this, uh, and it'll be nine. And you can think of each of these patches as a word. Uh, it's just like a, it's 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 a VIT basically. Then if we're doing self attention, you'll throw this through W sub Q, which is our queries. Um, that's our query weights, and you get out Q, uh, which is just whatever shape that is. Uh, you get out your queries, you get out your keys with W sub K, W sub K, and then you get out your values W sub V. Uh, passing Z through all three of those. And then you multiply Q and K together, Q, K, transpose, to get your um, your attention matrix. You throw that through a softmax function, and you multiply this the output of the softmax by the values. So I'm going to call this S, just for softmax. Then you do S times V. Or actually, I'll just call this O for your outputs, and that is that's your attention. But uh, or that's called self attention. Now with cross attention, what if we don't have? Uh, what if we don't? Let me just yeah. Now for cross attention, what if I have our image Z, our image Z over here? You break it up into patches, just like usual, and then you have your your sequence of patches, flattened patches. This will be our Z. But now in this case, we have our row. So this will take in text. This is row sub theta. 
and the theta means that you're training this. And you're going to be training this along with the normal diffusion model. And let's say the text, so this will be our text, or, or maybe images, or whatnot, and you put this through here, and this will output uh, your tokens in whatever sequence this is. And you can just use a VIT to do that. And this will be our output of row. Let's see, they, they may formally define it here. Uh, no, they don't. All right, so this is just our output of row right here. And this is our image. Um, you can see here that, um, yeah. So what we do is we can take the, the queries, W sub Q, and you put Z through the queries. This is gonna look a little, the arrows are gonna start going all over the place. And then you have W sub K and W sub V and you put the text embeddings through those. Uh, I'll draw it as blue for this one. Blue will be our image, and black will be our text. It'll be W sub Q. Then this outputs the queries, and the queries come from the image, while the keys and the values come from the uh, come from the text um, or image or whatever conditioning you're doing. Then to get to the attention matrix, you do Q, K transpose. And this gives you your attention matrix. And then you multiply, you throw that through the softmax. And then you multiply that with the values to get your output. Notice how our conditioning takes on the queries and the values, and then the uh, the image itself is the queries. Um, I don't know exactly why they chose to do that, but you could have probably chosen, I want the values to be from the, the image instead of the the, um, the, 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 the text or the image uh, conditioning. Uh, they may have just found that this worked best after trial and error and seeing, oh, if we make the queries the image, but uh, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that you are taking the queries, the key, or you're taking this image, and you're taking the text, and you're combining the information into one output. That's one of the really powerful parts about attention, is you can do cross-attention, which is just, um, you can kind of mix information together. And you can see, using the, the unit over here, as you're feeding images through, you can condition it on the uh, text. Uh, additionally, they have this switch right here, where you take the text and you, c or you t whenever I say text, I mean whatever you're conditioning on. You take whatever you're conditioning on, and you concatenate it to the image. So there's two ways of doing it. You, uh, you can concatenate the condition on the image, or you can condition the image with uh, cross attention. Either way, uh, works. They probably they probably found that cross attention works better, but it may uh, it may change depending on the modality you're using as the input. Uh, and then you train this row along with the uh, second the in the second step uh, step two that we defined right here. Train the diffusion model. Did I say D? It should be DM. <laughs> train the diffusion model. Train the diffusion model with both, or you're, whenever you're training the diffusion model, you're training both the unit and you're training the row sub theta, which is your multimodality encoder. And you train one row for each modality. So if I had uh, text go through here, then I would train this on text, but I would need another row. Uh, I would need another row to do, say, images. And this way you have a row for you have a, a model for each modality. Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's pretty much it for the um, latent diffusion model. Uh, one other thing that I want to add is um, a big a big thing that's kind of happening now is using diffusion as your base. So you may want to generate 64, sorry, 64 by 64 images with the diffusion model. So in this case, I'll say, okay, I have Z, 
a sample from a normal distribution. I create this latent, these latents, which I guess would also be Z. All right, this will be our epsilon from a normal distribution. Uh, it creates a, it creates our, you, you sample this a bunch of times and you create this latent space. Uh, let's say this is a, uh, in this case, I think they, I think they compress it by 16. So this would be our four by four latents. You throw this through the diffusion model uh, multiple times and you get out your, uh, this would be our Z sub T. This would be Z sub zero. This is a four by four image or four by four latents. And you take these latents and you throw it through the decoder, uh, the decoder over here, which, is, which would look like that. And you get out your image, which may be Joe. Yes. Welcome back, Joe. <laughs> you take your image, which will be 64 by 64. This, the decoder blows it back up because of the encoder decoder. And now you have your image, which uh, we'll call X. But 64 by 64 is small. Uh, why can't we just add, why can't we just make that larger? And you can use a super resolution model to do that. Um, you take this X and you throw it through another decoder. Uh, maybe you train another autoencoder that takes in a, like say maybe we have another autoencoder, a second one that takes in a 128 by 128 image. And then it produces your it produces a 64 by 64 image. Uh, 64 by 64 image. Or maybe you just train a decoder to do that. But anyways, you can take this image, you can throw it through a trained decoder, which knows how to uh, take a 64 by 64 image and then convert it to a 128 by 128 image. Now we got a high res Joe. Yeah, that is, that is high res right there, I tell you what. So uh, maybe you can even make it even larger. And the reason you don't just do this in this model right here is uh, there's no reason to, it, it's harder to just train one model to go directly from four by four to 120, 128 by 128. It's easier to go from four by four to 64 by 64, and then 64 by 64 to 128 by 128. Um, so you can super resolution it. And uh, I think they describe that down at the bottom, but uh, e yeah. So they sh show that um, on the left uh, is bicubic interpolation. So if we had a 64 by 64 image of a cow, or, uh, then it, this is what it looks like if you use bicubic interpolation to super resolution it. And this is what it looks like if you use a uh, model, a decoder model to interpolate it, uh, in this case LDM BSR, which I don't know what it is, I don't know what that stands for, but it looks way better. It's a lot less fuzzy. Uh, same with this image and this image. Uh, yeah, oh, in this case it's 1024, so you can blow it up to massive images, and that's, that's how you'd want to do it instead of going directly to 1024, because that's a lot of pixels <laughs> going from 4x4 four four to 1024. That's crazy. Uh, in this case, your your decoder would learn how to go from latent to image, and then this will learn how to go from image to image, and that's that's what that'll learn. Uh, anyways, you've probably seen some of the results already for how good this model is, and it just keeps getting better, so I won't worry about that. Uh, and yeah, I, that that is how the diffusion models or the latent diffusion models work. Uh, let me know if you got any questions. Throw them in the comments. Uh, also, sorry for the noise. Some people were moving all around. Anyways, uh, thank you for watching.